Good morning, Resurrection Church. My name is Nathan Mayer. I'm an elder here. This is Philip Mayer, my uh, eldest only son. And it's our joy to welcome you to Resurrection Church this morning. Have you ever had the experience of being disappointed or let down at church, by church? Maybe it was a, a bad Sunday morning experience. Maybe some, somebody was rude to you or hurt you. Maybe it's something you read in the news about a pastor failing or falling or about the church holding this position or that position. And you just found yourself let down by, um, by the church. I think that's almost a universal experience, uh, whether you've been here for a week or for decades, uh, to have experienced disappointment in the church. But the beautiful thing about church, about this project that God is working out right here at Res and around the world is that nowhere, nowhere else are you more likely to find people forgiving one another. Nowhere else are you more likely to find people serving and lifting up one another, looking for opportunities to bless each other, to encourage one another. Nowhere else are you gonna be more likely to find somebody repenting or praising God or uh, dreaming of new ways to serve their community. God is working out amazing things right here at Resurrection Church because for 2,000 years and still today, the church is God's program, his mission field to bring the entire world to himself, to reconcile all things to himself, to make all things new. And so church family, as we worship today, my, my hope, my heart for you is that we would worship as one family, as God's church, humbling ourselves and recognizing, yeah, we've got warts, we've got wrinkles, man, we're not always the prettiest bunch of people, but celebrating and rejoicing that God took this ragtag bunch of B-listers, brought us together, and is doing amazing, miraculous, and powerful things in us and through us and around us, through the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us. So let's stand and let's worship the risen Savior as one family with one voice as the church of God together today. Good morning, Resurrection Church. We're going to try something just a little different this morning. So uh, hopefully you've had your coffee and you're ready to stomp and clap with us. We're going to play uh, some oldies but goodies. Yeah, let's call it. Let's call it that. Oldies but goodies. Here we go. One, two, one, two, three. Hey, I saw the light. 
I saw the light No more darkness, no more night Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside Praise the Lord, I saw one more time I saw the light, I saw the light No more darkness, no more night Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside Praise the Lord, I saw the light
Parish, I'm the worship director here, and I'm so, so thankful that you guys decided to join us for Hoot Nanny Worship. It's also like my favorite thing to say, Hoot Nanny Worship. Hooray. Hoot Nanny. Hoot Nanny. <laughs> Yeehaw. Why don't you turn to someone that you know first and say to them, I love Hoot Nanny Worship. Yeehaw. Then find someone you don't know and then be normal to them. We'll be back. Yes. I love hearing all these people saying yeehaw. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You guys glad to be here today? I love hooting any worship. <laughs> People that know me go, no, you don't. <laughs> but I love worshiping God, so that was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. Everyone have your Bibles? You bring your Bibles? All right, let's open up to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 19. Am I supposed to introduce myself? Uh, he does do you, this to do me all the time. Do you guys care about this guy up here? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm Pastor Vance, teaching pastor here at the church. And I'm Pastor Mark, one of the lead pastors. So Vance, tell me, what's the last time you bought something as an investment? Oh boy. I bought books at the conference we went to. I have a book addiction. Vance has like 4,000 books or something. It's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. He's got like three libraries. We went by the Nixon library while we were down there. Yeah, that was cool. He wanted to break in and steal all the books. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about investments. So mm. Matthew 6, starting in verse 19, says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, and where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So let's talk about a little bit about investments and investing in something that's going to last. And here okay. it says, don't invest in, in, in the riches of the world because you can't take it with you. No, the only thing that lasts forever is God 
the things of God and our souls. That's right. And so uh, when we talk about investments here, let's talk about investing in something that will stand in time. When we invest in the kingdom of God, that investment will last forever. Amen. And so we talk about investing in the kingdom of God, investing in, in the work that, that God's doing through the church, through the local church. We talk about souls that are being saved and lives that are being changed and countries that are being changed because Amen. of the gospel message when we go out and we engage with the cultures around us. Amen. And so today, if you haven't taken that next step of consistently giving your tithes and offerings, then let today be that day where you start investing in the kingdom of God. You start investing in something that will stand the test of time and can mean something in people's lives. All right, so we're going to move on. In the pew in front of you, you'll find some cards. One of the cards is blue, and it says, I'm new here. If you have never filled out this card and you're new here, we would love for you to take this next couple minutes, take the opportunity to fill this out, put it in the offering um, boxes when you leave there at all the exits. Here at Resurrection Church, we want people to be known. And this is our starting place. This is where we start to get to know you and you can start to get to know us. And so uh, we would really cherish the opportunity to get to know you. So take a second, fill this out, put it in the offering boxes when you leave, and we will get in touch with you, and we will start this process of getting to know who you are. And then we have another card too, right? Yeah. The other card that we have is this one here in the pew. It says, I need prayer. Resurrection Church, we are a praying church. So if you have a prayer need, you have a praise, uh, you want some people to pray with you about that, please, please fill this out. Also drop it off in one of the offering boxes around the auditorium or out in the lobby. And we have prayer teams that love to lift prayer needs up to the Lord. So please fill this out and we would love to pray with you. Yeah, the big thing that we, we, we've been concentrating on this month and this past month is really about getting connected. Right. And today we want to talk about getting connected and raising the next generation. So uh, here at Resurrection Church, it's one of the things that we want to focus on is raising the next generation. And one of the ways we do that is on our Wednesday night programming. We have this thing called Invest. And Invest is our kids programming from age three. Oh, shh. I'm going to get in so much trouble. Jessica, called, Jessica, you didn't hear that. It's called Level Up. <laughs> but it's on ages, it's for ages three to sixth grade. And no matter what we're calling it, it is an incredible program that is all about teaching kids on their level about the Bible and about God. Amen. It's the firm foundation that we're trying to teach this next generation about the truth and about who God is and what his word says about us. And so that's happening on Wednesday night at 615. And the other thing that we have going on also Wednesday night, the exact same time as Level Up, we also have our youth ministry. And that ministry meets upstairs on the activities building and we have Bible study. We also have activities happening up there. We have community. It is a great, great ministry, and I'm personally involved in that. Uh, my nephews also go to Level Up, and they are blessed by that as well. So lots of good stuff happening here at this church uh, midweek on Wednesdays. Yeah. Let me say a prayer for us as we continue on in the service. Father God, Lord, uh, God, we love you. And we're so glad for this opportunity to worship you, to devote ourselves to your word today, God. Uh, today, God, I just ask you to be with Pastor Daniel as he's going to be delivering your words to us, God. Lord, I ask you to open our ears and soften our hearts um, to hear your word, God, and to move on it, Lord. Today, God, um, we are just so excited about what you're going to do today, knowing you're going to do a mighty work here in this church, God. Lord, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Jessica, please don't be offended by... Uh... <laughs> Good morning. 
name is Pastor Daniel. I'm one of the lead pastors here at Resurrection Church. Um, I had an opportunity actually on Wednesday to uh, teach at a youth program. I've got kids in the Level Up program and in the youth program. I have a senior in high school that uh, got into a CTEC program with the Kern County High School District, which is a uh, a medical program basically at night. And uh, so Wednesday nights is one of the three nights just to drive out to the campus to do this. And uh, she was having some FOMO about youth. Like she was like, I, I can't miss youth this much. So she called in sick to school to go to youth. That's an interesting parental problem. Uh, <laughs> but man, if you, if, you, if you have dad goals, it's that your kids are ready to skip school to go learn the Bible. I'll take it. So if your kids are not in Level Up, they're not in our youth program, uh, you're missing an opportunity to put them in Christian community. And uh, having uh, gotten to be in both those programs to teach, to help, and to have kids in them, I'll tell you, uh, your friends, your kids' friends matter. Probably more than anything else beyond your parenting, your, the community of people around your children matter. We're in a uh, series about humility. We're in week five of our series, Antidote for Self. An Antidote for Self is uh, a label, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, right? Because we're our own worst enemies, amen? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me uh, help. Your job beyond listening is when I say amen, you say amen as loud as possible. Amen? Yeah. There we go. See, uh, I, I realized, like, I went to a football game last night, at, and you go to a football game, and they teach you how to cheer, because, like, clearly we're all dumb. And... There was a DJ there. We were laughing because we got there like an hour early and the DJ, was, his voice was already cracking. And I was like, man, this can be a long night, brother. If we're an hour till game time and you already have lost your voice. But uh, it happens. Anyhow, no one seems embarrassed at a football game. When you lose your voice, you go hoarse, your voice cracks, right? Uh, so like, we, we shouldn't be embarrassed to be excited to be uh, together, praising the Lord, learning about him in community. Uh, worshiping him. So don't sit on your hands today. Uh, we're in week five. Uh, we've been going through the scripture, looking at various parts of humility, and uh, we've been reading a book together in our small groups. If you've not had an opportunity to do that, I would highly encourage you to jump in one. It's been a very good experience in our small group to open up that book and, and work with each other each week and talk through that subject. Today, uh, we're going to be talking about becoming unoffendable, becoming unoffendable. I know for some of you, you've, you've never been offended in your life. <laughs> and so I just want you to think about a friend of yours that has clearly been offended, and maybe you can take some nuggets away from them. All right, uh, Proverbs eighteen nineteen says this about being offended. It says, a brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. We are uh, a people now in modern society that, man, we're offended by everything, amen? amen. Like, my goodness, uh, I, people have been offended by my haircut, uh, people have been offended by Russ preaching barefoot. Uh, at some point, someone told my dad they were offended by the way I walked. I mean, like, you can... <laughs> literally be offended by anything at this point. And unfortunately, uh, it, it matters a lot. And so the Bible's actually gonna talk a little bit about that and we're gonna, we're gonna look at that. But being offended uh, creates some, some substantial barriers in our ability to mature in Christ and to walk in the joy and the freedom that is Christ. And um, I wanna take you all the way back to a story in the Old Testament. It's probably one of your favorite stories. You probably tell your kids at, at bedtime and stuff. It's uh, 2 Chronicles 26, King Uzziah. Yeah? No? Did we miss the felt board on that one? Okay. Um, well, you're gonna learn something new. You're gonna, you're gonna love this story. There's stuff in this story that if you've not... If you don't recall, that there's some, there's some pretty wild stuff in the story. You're going to enjoy it. And I'll give you some background. Uh, king Uzziah is the third king in a row in uh, the land of Judah, um, essentially to start well and finish poorly. And so we're going to see kind of a theme that the chronicler in Second Chronicles is trying to show us about these kings that come through Judah. Um, start well, don't finish well. But there's some, some really great stuff in here. So open your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles 26 all day. Verse 1. <clears throat> and all of the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. Now, I, already, we're only one verse in, and I'll tell you, what a great idea to take a 16-year-old and put him in the throne. 
Because if there's anyone that has all the answers, it's a teenager. Oh, man, like now is when you should put them in when like they already know everything. You wait longer and they'll real. Oh, anyways, okay. So he's 16. Um, just some background on Uzziah. His dad is, was Amaziah, and Amaziah and Uzziah's grandfather, Amaziah's father, were both kings of Judah. Started well, didn't end well. Uh, both are part of this critical theme that we're going to see in Second Chronicles that uh, start kind of white hot for the Lord, don't, don't end well. And that has a lot of parallels to last week. If you're here last week, Pastor Vance was taking us through Revelation, and in Revelation, that second part of that letter that he was reading about the church of Laodicea that started really well and then becomes lukewarm. They lose their impact for the gospel. They lose their desire to pursue the Lord. So a lot of, a lot of parallels to last week as well. Um, if you're not real familiar with this, in the Old Testament, God's people, the 12 tribes of Israel, split into two countries, Israel and Judah. And so we're primarily going to focus on Judah here. In Uzziah's reign, in this time, and he's going to reign for 52 years, uh, there's a king uh, that actually takes over Israel at the same time, so the other kingdom. His name is Jeroboam II, and he actually, these are some of the longest periods of, of prosperity in the two kingdoms in all of the Old Testament. Outside of maybe David and Solomon, this is probably the best it's going to be in the, in the Old Testament, which is saying something. Um, so here we go. He's 16. He's on the throne. Y'all, y'all with me still, right? I was like, I was just giving you, like, if you, if you start a series at, like, episode four, you know, you have to give a little recap. So it was your recap, okay? All right, here we go. Verse two, 16-year-old Uzziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his father. So that means his dad died. Uzziah was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. A couple of things here. Eloth, uh, also pronounced Elath, was under Edomite control. Um, by going and taking over and restoring Eloth, uh, what Uzziah does is he actually gives Judah access to sea trade from Arabia and from Africa and from India. So there's massive economic implications for him taking over and restoring this port and taking control of it. But the big thing about verse four that you see here is it says, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. That's a really key phrase. And here's why. If you read the Old Testament, most of the kings of Judah, most of the kings of Israel It does not say that. It says, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. In fact, it says that so many times in the Old Testament that by the end, you're frustrated with them. You're like, if you guys could just get it together. Because we, I mean, I got it all put together, right? (laughs) You do too. The Old Testament is pretty frustrating. Like, Like you see king after king after king, do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, do what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then you get to Uzziah, who's a 16 year old, and it says he did what was Good in the side, like, wait, what? He did what was right in the side of a 16 year old? Here's how, verse five. It's pretty cool, pretty unique. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who's the high priest, who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Okay. Don't, don't miss the fact that a 16 year old's taking the throne. So if I told you just that, you're already going like, this ain't gonna end well. I mean, we think we got it bad with the presidents we've had lately. How about a 16 year old? <laughs> At some point, like no one could drive. I think we'd do better. Anyways, okay. He chose to seek the Lord. He chose to be a learner. So, so the, the backstory of Uzziah's dad, Amaziah, is where he gets himself in trouble, if you turn back to 2 Chronicles 25, is God actually sends him via the high priest, counsel, godly counsel, and he rejects that godly counsel. And it, his downfall is a high priest trying to help him with wisdom from the Lord and him rejecting it. So it's a pretty big deal that a 16-year-old realizes at 16, who takes the throne, he is the ultimate ruler in the country, and he decides he wants to seek the Lord. And this is big. He realizes he doesn't know how. I just told you a 16-year-old admitted he didn't know something. This is mind-blowing stuff. 
And he humbles himself and he goes to the high priest, the very office that his dad denied, and he asks for instruction on how to seek the Lord. There is a massive amount of humility here. He, he wants to learn. Now, here's, here's what I want to tell you about seeking the Lord. You're gonna, we're about to read just the whole, this whole chapter of blessings that come from him seeking the Lord. All that mattered here is that he had a desire to seek the Lord. And he was willing to try to figure out how to do it and, and humble himself to do it. Listen, Christian, it doesn't matter if you think, it doesn't matter if you have good or bad self-discipline. It doesn't matter if you have this, a perfect plan or you, you have no clue as to how you would seek the Lord. What matters is you, you, you intellectually have this, this understanding that you need to follow the Lord, you need to seek the Lord, and you're willing to do things about it. If you will humble yourself to seek the Lord, God will respond to that humility. And God does. God does great things through this. He goes to Zechariah, the high priest, and, and is instructed on wanting to seek the Lord. He is humbling himself. He's admitting that he does not know, that he needs to be taught. There is a, a posture here of humility, a posture of I'm in need, I'm wrong, I'm ignorant. Verse six, here is God's response to that posture. Uzziah, verse six, he went out and made war against the Philistines and broke through the wall of Gath and the wall of Jebna and the wall of Ashdod and he built cities in the territory of Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. So we've just read that he's a, a humble person. He's, he's humbling himself to seek the Lord and to learn how to do it. And then he's admitting that he doesn't know and he's putting himself under the instruction of the high priest. And then the very next verse, we're not reading about someone that's super passive or a wallflower or super weak or mild because he's making war against his enemies and he's going into their land and he's breaking down their walls and he's conquering their cities. And then he's not leaving. He's building his own cities on top of their cities. That's not a passive ruler. That is not a passive man. Being humble doesn't mean being weak. It takes great strength to be humble. It takes great confidence to be a learner, to admit, I don't know, and I need to, because God's worth it. Verse seven, God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians who lived in Gerbal and against the Midianites. The Ammonites paid tribute to Uzziah and his fame spread even to the border of Egypt before he became very strong. Most of Uzziah's military con uh, conquests are going to be to the south, but in every direction from Judah, his enemies are going to realize his success and his strength to the extent that they're coming and paying him money to not be on his bad side. I mean, your power has grown a great deal when people you're not even at war with are coming and just giving you money. I mean, this is like the scene from Friday. I probably shouldn't use this example. <laughs> Pretend I didn't say that. Just tuck your gold chain in. Okay, okay, anyways. That's a pretty powerful ruler if people that you're not at war with just to stay on your good side are just bringing you presents. The only time I like the only time that happens in my house is when mom has that look in her eyes and everyone's like, oh no, and we all go to get something, like let's let's feed her, maybe she <laughs> It keeps going, it gets better. Verse nine. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the angle and fortified them. And he built towers in the wilderness and he cut out many cisterns for he had large herds both in Shepelah and in the plain. And he had farmers and vine dressers in the hills and in the fertile lands for he loved the soil. He what? He what? Like, so wait, thus, we're only like, 10 verses in, he's a 16-year-old who has humbled himself, put himself under the mentorship of the high priest, gone out, made war, conquered enemies, kicked down walls, built up cities. Now he's carving out cisterns for agriculture and for all of the herds, and he's got vine dressers, and this dude's like, he's, he's, he's planting grapes, and he's, he's got like a green thumb. He's like a gardener on top of a warrior. I don't know if there's gardener warriors. He's like Paul Bunyan or I don't know. He loves the soil? 
So, so he's, he's building and he's planning and he's attacking and he's defending Judah and he's providing for his people and he enjoys long walks in the garden, apparently. It's like a Match.com profile. Swipe. Anyways, okay. Verse 11, it keeps going. Moreover, like we're just adding to this list. Moreover, Uzziah had an army of soldiers fit for war in divisions according to the numbers in the muster made by Jael, the secretary, and Masai, the officer, under the direction of Hananiah, one of the king's commanders. Verse 12, the whole number of the heads of fathers' houses of mighty men of valor was 2,600. That's like lieutenants and captains. Under the command was an army of 307,500 who could make war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Uzziah prepared for all the army shields, spears, helmets, coats of mail, bows, and stones for slinging. So he was already a planner. He's already uh, a detail person. He's already assertive and aggressive, taking the war to his enemies. He is providing for his people, carving out cisterns, building infrastructure, and he's an organizer and a planner. He is a leader of leaders and a men of, man of men. He has a hierarchy of delegated authority of people underneath him, 300,000 soldiers that he's both been uh, providing for, training, and created a system of management for. This is one impressive guy. There are some significant uh, parallels here between Uzziah and King David. We would call these Davidic attributes, things that are parallel to King David. We see all throughout the early part of Uzziah's life here. Humble, seeking the Lord, blessed by the Lord. Verse 15, keeps going. This is the one that's unreal. You probably didn't even know this was in the Bible. Verse 15, in Jerusalem, he made machines invented by skillful men to be on the towers of the corners to shoot arrows and great stones. He did what? So he was a gardener, a warrior, a planner, a ruler, a leader, and an inventor? It's like Tony Stark. Got like T-1000 mechs on the, on the thing shooting arc reactors. I don't know. This is in the 8th century BC. He's building machines. In reality, this is probably just like a scaffolding where they interlock shields so men could stand behind them and shoot arrows. But I like to, in my mind, imagine it's like an Iron Man suit. And you do you. Impressive. Let's look at the end of verse 15. And his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped. In your Bible, underline marvelously. Marvelously helped. At the moment you came to the realization that God was saving you, when you put your faith in Christ and he indwelt you with his Holy Spirit, you became marvelously helped. You may not accept that at times. You may not see that at times. You may not be grateful for that at times, but you became marvelously helped. The riches of his glory, the presence of the Holy God dwelling inside of you, we are marvelously loved and marvelously helped. Till he was strong. You see, if we change that comma to a period, and we just stop the story right there. Wow. Wow. If we could just stop at the comma and look at the success, 52 years of being marvelously helped by the Lord. And what did that come from? Where did that start? Number one, a desire to seek the Lord. Listen to me. Not answers. You don't have to have all the answers. I'm not telling you that. Not, oh man, I've memorized all this stuff and I know all this stuff and I've studied all this. No, 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 no. A desire to seek the Lord. Just a desire to seek the Lord. N not the end of the, the path, not the end of the journey, not the end of the maturation process. If you want to be marvelously helped by the Lord, it starts with a desire to seek the Lord. Secondly, a posture of humility. In order to learn anything... You have to admit that you don't know it. I know this is mind-blowing logic. 
If you already know everything, you can't learn anything. You ever met someone that couldn't learn anything? They're the most frustrating people. I know it's your friend and not you. <laughs> when we should, we should aspire to be lifelong learners. You should never stop learning. There's never an arrival point. Arrival is called heaven. Desire to seek the Lord, a posture of humility and an attitude of a learner. These are the things that led Uzziah to be marvelously helped for 52 years where his fame spread across continents. But we got to read the other part of the story. And it's the other part of the story, frankly, that is why we don't read this as a bedtime story. Uzziah, for 52 years, has seen military success that has been unparalleled. Financial success, I guess herbology success, I don't even know how to say that, agriculture. Architectural success, planning, design. Everything this guy touches in for 52 years, for five decades, has turned to gold. He's like, he's like Elon Musk, if Elon was a Christian and not a dork. <laughs> Until he was strong. Verse 16. But when he was strong, he grew, what's that word? Proud. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. Is it possible to be strong and not proud? Yes. What? Yes. yes, it is. Certainly is. Jesus has shown us that. It's possible if you know where your success comes from. But it all goes wrong for him here at Pride. And it didn't start there. We know that it started in an attitude of humility. We know that he did not start prideful. If he started prideful, he would have never humbled himself to ask Zechariah to teach him how to seek the Lord. So pride built in him. And I want to look at what happened, why it happened, and how it goes wrong. He didn't start proud. He became proud. Here's the verse right here. For he was unfaithful to the Lord, his God, and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now, if you don't know much about the Old Testament, I realize that that does not seem like a very big deal. It's like, so he turned on a sensi and God was mad, like I don't even understand. Uh, no, no, let's, let's understand what the temple was. The temple was God's dwelling place. The temple was meant to show the separation between man and God. It was both symbolic and it was the dwelling place of God. God had taken the sons of Aaron and he had consecrated them, meaning he had set them apart from all of the other tribes. And he had said, you're going to consecrate yourself. You're gonna go through symbol, uh, different types of ritual and symbolic washing and cleansing because no one, because of sin, can be in my presence. So, so I'm gonna put these steps there so that you will understand the weight of sin and the problem, the separation between man and God, and only you will come into the temple to do these things. And it's, it, 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 it is a huge deal. Like God's holiness you, in, in modern culture, because like everything goes in 2023, we underestimate God's holiness. And God is primarily concerned with your holiness, not your happiness. God is a holy God. To the extent that the Ark of the Covenant, which sits in the Holy of Holies in the center of the temple, when the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the enemies of Israel, um, and they, they had been cursed so much that they sent it back to David, and it's coming back, uh, and, and no one really knows all the, the rituals of what you're not supposed to do with the Ark of the Covenant. At one point, it's coming back on a, on a cart, and uh, it looks like it's going to fall, and a guy reaches out and touches the Ark of the Covenant and dies for touching it accidentally. That's how serious God is about his holiness. First Chronicles 13, 10, and the anger of the Lord is kindled against Uzzah and he struck him down because he put out his hand to the ark and he died there before God. He's serious about his holiness. And that was incidental and accidental. Uzziah knows he's not to be in the temple. He knows these are not things for him. Let me tell you why it's such a big deal. If you go all the way back to Genesis, uh, there is a king, a Melchizedek, and he is a king and he is a high priest, both at the same time. And what we see is there's never again 
in the Bible, from Old Testament to New Testament, there's never again a king who's also a high priest. God will not allow those two to be the same thing. He needs you to understand the difference between the representative of God and the representative of the people. So he splits those roles and he says they never can touch and they don't touch until you get to Hebrews and you read that the king of kings and lord of lords is now also the great high priest. And that's Jesus. And so that split in role of ruling the people and being a representative to God can never touch again until Jesus brings them back together on the cross by his blood. So by doing that, what Uzziah is doing is taking the place of Jesus. He knows he's not supposed to do these things. This is intentional. He should die right there, but he doesn't. God is merciful Verse 17, but Azariah, the priest, went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor. Now, I don't know if you've had to go have a conversation with somebody to correct them. I've had to do that from time to time. I've yet to bring 80 people with me. It's a lot. I'm just going to say, like, if you think Uzziah was intimidating, he's clearly intimidating. If I got to get 80 homies to back me up, like, I'm going to get a guy or two or 78 more. Like, I, that's kind of weird. This conversation probably could have gone better. In fact, in, in the New Testament, Jesus, and then later the apostles, will, will teach us what it looks like to go to someone when we've been wronged or when, when we see sin and we need to correct it. And actually, it will tell us to do it very differently than this. In Matthew 18, 15 and 16, it'll say this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him. Say that out loud. Again. Alone, American church. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Listen, it, 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 in American culture, in American church culture, unfortunately, we do uh, two things very often. One of two things often when, when someone sins against us or when we see sin that needs correcting. Either we ignore it and we tolerate sin, which is not holy. Or we see it and it bothers us and so we tell everybody but the person. We have words for that. One's called slander, the other's called gossip. And when you don't go to the person privately to have that conversation, I don't care if you don't like conflict. It's gossip, it's slander, it's sin. And gossip and slander have destroyed more churches than any substance abuse or any sexual sin have. So it's serious. And no, Azariah does not do this well. He takes 80 people with him. The chances that this seems uh, gentle is, is poor. However, however, even though the, the correction's not given well, it's still for Uzziah to receive. Verse 18. Here's what Azariah and his 80 homeboys did. They withstood King Uzziah and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Now here's the thing. No, bringing 80 people with you is probably not the right plan, but is there anything false about what he said? No, that's the truth. There, there's no lie there. He may, we, could, we can certainly critique whether or not he used the right tone. And did he have the right posture? Was he gentle enough with me? Did he have to bring 80 people? Clearly not. It takes a while to find 80 anyways. But it doesn't matter how well the correction is given. It is your job to discern if there is any truth in that correction. It is my job when someone brings me correction, no matter how poorly they bring it, to figure out if there's any truth in that correction. And I'm going to show you why it's so critical that that happens. Uzziah has sinned. God did not strike him dead. He had mercy on Uzziah and he sent him 
correction. Correction that was intended to lead Uzziah to repentance. Well, we see this happen with King David. We talked about some of the Davidic attributes that we see parallels here. David did a bunch of bad stuff. I'm not gonna go through all the bad stuff. Like it's a soap opera of bad stuff. It's cover up and cover up and cover up and, and he just digging the hole as deep as he can dig it. And then God sends the prophet Nathan and Nathan confronts him with the truth and he calls him to repentance. And David's reaction is sorrow, contrition, repentance, which is God having mercy on David. God is having mercy on Uzziah. He's, think about this. He sends him the very role, high priest. He sends him the very role, the very office that Uzziah, when 52 years earlier, sought help and wisdom and, and mentorship from. When he was 16, he went to the high priest. God sends him the high priest and 80 friends, but he sends him the high priest. It's merciful. It's God calling him to repentance. And here's what Uzziah does. Verse 19. Then Uzziah was angry. Now listen, I know that when you're corrected, you never get angry. So I want you to think of a friend who when they get corrected is immediately angry. Mad at being corrected. We call that pride. Let's say that quietly. Then Uzziah is angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And when he became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they rushed him out quickly. And he himself hurried to go out because the Lord had struck him. And King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And being a leper lived in a separate house for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. He was ceremonially unclean at that point. He wasn't allowed to be in the house of God. He wasn't around, allowed to be around the people of God. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's household, governing the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah from first to last, Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, wrote, and Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the burial field that belonged to the kings, for they said, he is a leper. And Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. End of story. What happened? What happened? Instead of repentance, he's offended. Here's what I want you to see. He makes a grievous error by going into the temple. An error that has been met with death previously in the Bible. God has mercy on him. God is gracious to him. God sends him correction to call him to repentance. And then he's not punished for going into the temple. He's punished for getting offended. He's struck with leprosy for becoming offended. God sends him correction and his response to repentance, instead of repentance, is offense. He's struck with leprosy immediately. He's rushed out of the temple, out of town. He lives as a recluse to the day he dies. He loses his kingdom. He loses his success. He loses even his freedom to move about and enjoy his family. And he dies a hermit because he was offended. Because he was offended. Proverbs 18, 19. A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city and quarreling is like bars of a castle. I read this quote I wanted to read to you. It says this. A guy quotes first, <clears throat> Proverbs 19, 11 says this. Good sense makes one slow to anger and it is his glory to overlook an offense. In moments of calm, the wise man's counsel sounds so right, so sane. Overlooking offenses is our glory. Then the offenses actually come and we often find them too large to look over. The actual size of the offense often matters little. A spouse's consistent fault finding, a boss's unfair criticism, a stranger's unaccountable rudeness. Given the right circumstances, any of these may rise up in front of us like a giant. Peripherals blur, tunnel vision ensues, and we have eyes only for the offense. Even if sanity swiftly returns, the damage is often already done. We returned tone for tone, passive aggression for passive aggression, jab for jab, or we restrained ourselves externally, but only as a small volcano erupted inside of us, or we quietly smoldered, playing the incident on repeat the rest of the day. Not that you've ever repeated a story in your head over and over again, but for your friend. 
Two types of offense I want to look at here. Uh, the one that is affecting Uzziah here in this story, um, which we would call a merited offense, and then unmerited offense. I want to look at both. This is merited. Uzziah has earned this correction. God has been gracious to send it to him. He just doesn't like it. The majority of the time when you're offended, the offense is not actually true. Just let you in on that little secret. Most offenses aren't real. Some are, for sure, but not most of them. But think about this. Um, how often, when someone corrects you, are you like, oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. That's so good. I mean, someone comes up and he's like, hey, brother, sister, listen, um, I'd like to sit down. I have some real, I've been watching you, just kind of watching your lifestyle and, and listening to you speak with others. And I have some real concerns just about the way you're acting and behaving around other people and some of the things you're saying. You're telling me you're going to hear that and be like, oh, that would be so excellent. Let's get coffee. Oh, your shields are going to like, shields up, Scotty, right? Like, that's an old, old reference for some of you. Uh, I mean, like, the defenses are like, the claws are coming out, right? In fact, the moment you begin to hear that they're trying to correct you, you're, the first thing that's coming in your head is, oh, you got some stuff to talk about me, but well, I got some stuff I've been noticing about you. I got a list. Let me get this list out. We should desire correction. We don't. But we should. Proverbs 15.32 says this. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, hates himself. But he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. Proverbs 12.1 would say this way. If you don't listen to correction, you're stupid. That's the, that's the Bible. I'm not being mean. The Bible's being mean. Stupid. It says it. The, the problem is we know, we know intellectually we're not perfect, right? I mean, no one out here is trying to walk on water. We know. We're messy people. We're messed up. We should then expect correction, welcome correction, be excited about correction because we're going to learn stuff and we are not. That's pride. That's pride. Merited offenses, correction. They offend us. They shouldn't. Number two, when we're overlooked. You ever felt overlooked? Like not recognized for what you're doing? Everyone I know has at some point felt overlooked. Man, I don't see what I'm doing, right? I'm just being overlooked. I'm not, like, not getting the recognition that I deserve. Listen, the, the biblical model is going to tell you that no matter what you do, you serve God, not men. So when you go to work, you, you don't work for your boss's approval or up to your boss's standard. You work for the Lord's approval to the Lord's standard. That's a very different standard. When you're working in ministry, it really doesn't matter whether or not other people see the effort because God sees the effort and your reward is a heavenly reward. We talked about in our need to know, storing up treasures in heaven, storing up recognition in, in, in human form is folly. We want things that last. We work for the Lord. Colossians 3, 23, we say, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. I... Why do I need human recognition? Like, wh wh where is my identity so poorly rooted in Christ that I'm gonna lose my mind if I'm not recognized by people? Merited offenses when I'm corrected, when I'm overlooked, and when I'm slighted. When I'm slighted. You know, when, when someone says something, this happens a lot in text messages. I don't know if you recognize, like, an email, a text message, and you read it and you're like, did they say what, what I think they just said? Are they, like, are they? You know, you read like, you read the tone in it, even when there's no tone in the text, but somehow you read the voice in your head, you're like, I'm gonna need a minute before I type that reply. Do you know that the Bible commands us to give others the benefit of the doubt, to think the best of others? 
I've actually had people say, I don't think the Bible says that. And I'm like, you're not reading the Bible. First Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter, like literally you'll, you can never go to a wedding without hearing it. Um, is Paul explaining what love actually is to a church in Corinth that has distorted it wildly. And in verse seven, it says this, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It, it, when you read something, when someone says something to you in a certain way and you could take that one way or you could take it a good way, take it a good way! Give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe I just misinterpreted that. You probably did. We are not prone to do that. You are, you are prone to take it the wrong way and then think about it all day long. And then type seven responses that you delete. What have you done? You've thought the worst of them. You've thought the worst of them. You could have chosen to think the best of them. You know what's amazing about thinking the best of other people? There's a lot more joy in it. When you think the worst of people, you're constantly repeating that little scene in your head over and over and over and over and get it dwelling on. When you think the best of people, you're like, oh, I can move on with my day. Because there's a weight to it. We're commanded to give others the benefit of the doubt. Now, those are three things where they're kind of merited offenses. I mean, they're, they're, we have made up the offense, but there is such a thing as an unmerited offense. When someone is out to hurt you, they're, they're legitimately trying to attack you, to hurt you, to wound you, whether those are physical, whether those are mental, whether those are verbal abuses. Those are real. And, and I wanna give you an example of the response to an unmerited offense, and then I wanna show you in scripture how we choose the response. Um, Dr. Russell Moore, who's SBC president uh, for years, um, came under fire in the last election cycle. Donald Trump just out of kind of nowhere decided he was going to take a shot at him publicly in an interview and, uh, or on Twitter or something. And he said this to about R Russell Moore, the president of the SBC. He said, Russell Moore is truly a terrible representative of evangelicals and all of the good they stand for, a nasty guy with no heart. It's hard to give that the benefit of the doubt, right? He's taking a shot at him. That's an insult. He's trying to malign him. Here's what Russell Moore said when they asked him about it. Because of course, news agencies got it, right? And they ran to Russell Moore like, what do you say? Like, oh, let's get some drama here. Let's sell some ads. Get people riled up. Russell responded to him by saying that he agreed with Donald Trump. He said, we Christians sing worse things about ourselves every Sunday at church. I'm a nasty guy with no heart, which is why I need forgiveness of sins and redemption through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, even when the offense is real, even when the offense is real, if humility is a right perspective of us and God, th then it allows us to have a realization that there's nothing that you can say about me that is actually as bad as I really am. Because if you really knew who I was, you'd think even less of me. That's not false humility. It's recognizing who we are and why we're in such need of a savior. Now, there are going to be real offenses. And I, some of you have been deeply wounded, whether it was wounded in a church, wounded by a family member, wounded by, in a relationship, wounded by a coworker, um, harmed in real ways. They will come. You, you will be hurt in this life. The Bible is clear that we will have suffering in this life, that our best life is to come, not now. You can, you can save your little hashtags of living my best life. If you're a Christian, that's a bull. Your best life ain't now, it's later. First Peter 4.12 would say this, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though some strange thing were happening to you. Why are you shocked that they're suffering? We've tried to warn you. <laughs> The key to living a life that can overlook a real offense is, to, is given to us in 1 Peter 2.19. I want to I just focus on this verse for a few moments. 1 Peter 2.19 says this, and this is really critical. 
For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Unjustly. There's a key in this verse, both that points to the fact that we will suffer unjustly and that every time we suffer unjustly, there is an opportunity to extend grace And the way we do that is in the verse as well. It's mindful of God. It's mindful of God. There are three things in this verse that you need to see about offense. Number one, God sees every offense. That suffering, that offense, that harm, that hurt that you received unjustly, God knew about, God saw, God was there. He was not absent from that hurt or harm. In fact, number two, God sends every offense. God allows trials. He allows suffering. He allows those things to happen. That is hard to wrap our head around when we've been wounded deeply. And number three, and this is the hope that you get to cling to, God will judge every offense. Christian, there is a day coming when every person in history will stand before a true God and they will answer for every harm, every harmful word, every harmful action, every contrary action or thought or deed, they will answer to a perfectly just God and the answer will be one of two things, either that offense is covered by the blood of Christ or they are going to pay the price for it. There's a day coming where every offense will be put right. Paul talks about what it looks like to be mindful of God when it comes to suffering, when it comes to harm, when it comes to offense. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10, he says, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of Christ, mindful of God, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I want you to take these four practical steps from uh, this sermon, and then we're going to close. We're going to have a time of uh, invitation and prayer. Uh, Four things. When you're offended, okay? When you're offended. Here it is. This is your application. Get your bulletin out. Get your pen out. Don't miss this part. Number one, when you're offended or when you feel offended, number one, tell yourself, it's probably not real. Say it out loud. Do it again. It's probably not real. This week, I had someone do something and I was immediately offended, like, like, like microseconds, right? I was like, oh. <laughs> and I sat there for about five minutes and I just went, I don't think that's real. I think I'm making this up. Like, I'm pretty sure. And I had to look at it about five different ways. You ever look at it all the different ways? Could be this, could be this. Oh, could be that. And I went through all the scenarios. I was like, no, I am pretty sure I'm making this up. I feel this way, but it's not real. You ever feel some way, but, but, but someone has to come speak a little bit of truth in your life and go, that's not real. Amen? That's why good friends matter. It's probably not real, number one. Number two, this is the key to living an unoffendable life. Choose not to be offended. Sounds simple, right? Sounds super easy, barely an inconvenience. We are a new creation in Christ, but we're still living in this fleshly body in a distorted, broken world, and we're not made perfect yet. And there's gonna be a pull in us to be offended. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen all the time. It's gonna happen for little things. It's gonna happen for big things. It's gonna happen for imaginary things. It's gonna happen for real things. And we have to choose to not be offended. And here's what's happening when your flesh is yelling at you, you should be offended. How dare they? You ever, you ever run that one in your head? <gasps> you know what you're saying to yourself? You know what your flesh is telling you? You don't deserve to be treated that way. They shouldn't talk to you that way. You deserve better than that. No one deserves to be called. Did you, the way they over, oh my, you don't deserve that. Christian, let me remind you, you deserve hell. 
My sins put Jesus on the cross. My sins crucified him. My sins killed God's son. You know what I deserve? Eternal punishment. I don't deserve. I don't deserve anything. Man, I'm only here by the grace of God who took an orphan who tried to kill him, cleaned him up, made him a new creation, put his righteousness on like a white robe, put a ring on his finger, and then called him son and gave him an inheritance. I don't deserve anything. Get out of that. If I got what I deserve, I'd be, man, I don't want what I deserve. The moment you think you deserve something, you should be like, don't want that. Don't want that. That's like mixing up your, your report card at school and someone gives you straight A's that you didn't earn and you're like, I don't want what I deserve. I want this. You have been running around saying, like, I need the report card I deserve. When, 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 when your flesh begins to yell at you that you deserve better treatment or, or, or more honor or more recognition or... Man, stop, stop, stop. Choose to not be offended. It is a choice. It is a choice. And here's how you know it's a choice. Other people aren't why you're getting offended. You are. Uzziah, Uzziah's issue here, right? Uzziah's issue is not the chief priest. Oh, yeah, he did some stuff wrong, but that's not the problem. The problem is whose? Uzziah. How do we know it's Uzziah's problem? Because God punishes who? Uzziah. If it was the high, if it was the chief priest's fault, if it was his problem, God punishes him. No, God was being merciful to Uzziah. God's Show, leading him to repentance, calling him to repentance, giving him correction, putting someone in his life and saying, stop, look out, this is sinful. The majority of time, maybe every single time that you're offended, it's not because of other people. You want to blame other people. You want to say, I'm only offended because they treated me with this way. No, you're only offended because you chose to be offended. In addiction, uh, in recovery from substance abuse or sex addiction or any of these addictions, as we go through recovery with, with folks and we walk through recovery, one of the first things that we have to start with is you have to get to the point that no one else caused your addiction. You're the addict. It's not other people. If you, you can't get to the point where you can take responsibility for your own addiction, then there's nothing really to work on. And as long as we're playing the blame game and it's always somebody else's fault, we never actually walk in restoration toward anything. And the same thing goes for being offended. It's not other people that are making you offended. You're choosing to be offended. Crazy thought here. Stop choosing that. Choose to think the best of people. Choose to remember where you came from. Choose to remember what you deserve. It's gonna be a whole lot easier to walk in joy. And even when those unmerited offenses come, we get to, for this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Third thing, when you're offended, I'm gonna to choose to not be offended. And then your next thought, your next thought when you say, I'm gonna choose, say it out loud, I'm gonna choose not to be offended. Your next thought is, I wonder if God is calling me to repentance. Because so often when we're offended, it's actually God being gracious, sending someone to call us to repentance. It, it is interesting to me that the act of Uzziah going into the temple to do these things is essentially saying, I'm gonna take your role, chief priest. I don't need you, you priests who are consecrated to do this. I'm Uzziah, you need me to do this. So what he's doing is he's, he's minimizing, he's overlooking, he's kind of demeaning the role of priest. And who's the one guy that God sends to come and correct him? the same guy that he's overlooking and demeaning. And, and there's a pattern in the Bible and there's a pattern in our lives that oftentimes God will take the people that we overlook and that we don't want to listen to, sometimes non-Christians, sometimes people we despise, and he will send those people to us to correct us. Feels good, doesn't it? That story happens again and again and again in the Bible. I mean, it gets so comical in the Bible that at one point a donkey turns around and corrects a guy and it's not Shrek. <laughs> it's in the Bible. 
The people that you overlook, the people that you minimize, the people that you think less of, the people you don't really like that much are the very people that God will often use to send correction to you to call you to repentance. So you'll be prone to be offended very quickly when they say something. And in reality, God is being gracious to you. He is lovingly and mercifully calling you to repentance. So get off your high horse and choose not to be offended. And then ask yourself, I wonder if God is calling me to repent. Could it be, last thing, could it be that the Lord has blessed me with a chance to extend grace? Could it be? The Lord has blessed me with a chance to extend grace. We know that the, the, the root of the, the sin nature, the root of the sin problem in us is pride. How do we know that? Because the first sin in the Garden of Eden was based on pride because Satan and his issue is actually pride, right? Satan is thrown out of heaven because of pride. And then he comes and he tempts Adam and Abel and it's pride. Pride is at the root of all of these things. So doesn't it make sense that if, that if pride is the main problem in our life, like a bigger problem and a more ubiquitous universal problem in the human condition than any other problem, that what God is gonna have to do is again and again and again, he's gonna have to assault your pride. Oh, I didn't like the sound of that. <laughs> Anyone like their pride getting trampled on? Except how else is God going to make us humble? So we should be prepared for the fact that we are prideful and God's going to have to poke and push and prod and mold us in the process of sanctification and make him more like us and make us more holy because he cares about your holiness. That Your pride is going to get afflicted and assaulted again and again, not so you can be offended, but so that you can become holy. So I'm not telling you this so that you can walk out of here and your pride's never gonna get hurt again. I'm telling you this so that you can begin to look for when your pride does get hurt and realize that God is trying to transform you. It's part of the process. Again and again and again, God is gonna put you in situations in your life in which your natural response is exactly the opposite of the response that he wants. And he's gonna put you repeatedly back into those circumstances until you choose the holy choice. And so if you find yourself on an endless cycle of offense or an endless cycle of being harmed or an endless cycle of something, it is because God continues to put you back in a scenario and says, choose wisely, choose me, choose to seek me, choose not to be offended. And lastly, um, I want to just remind you, even with real offenses, even with those unmerited offenses where we're suffering unjustly, God calls us to forgiveness. And forgiveness is for us more than it's for the other person. Carrying around the weight of unforgiveness is an anchor that you carry. It is a burden that you carry. And, and God will call us to forgiveness. God will call you to forgive people internally, privately, where no one knows a thousand times more than you'll ever do some big public forgiveness thing. All of those little things you could be offended by or you are, have been harmed by that, that may actually have been real harms, God will call you to let those things go at the foot of the cross and put your confidence in him that he is a just God and everyone will stand before his throne someday. And when you hold on to unforgiveness, you are just ingesting poison and it's killing you. We're gonna close this service. Um, our prayer team and our elders are gonna be up here. One, we would love to pray with you for any reason, whether that's, you have a just general question of how do I get started to seek the Lord? What does it look like to put my faith in Christ? What does it look like to get started in discipleship or mentorship community? We would love to answer those questions for you. Two, you have general prayer requests of anything I don't care, we wanna pray for you. And third, today, as we've been dealing with offense and many of us, uh, if we're being honest, it's not about our friend, it's about us and there is an offense and it runs through our head all the time. And we think about it 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 and we've not let it go and we've not overlooked it and we've not forgiven. And I wanna give you an opportunity to today at this altar, if you don't even wanna to talk to anyone, if you don't even want prayer for it, that's fine. You come up here and at least give it to the Lord and choose to not be offended. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you for your son, for the gospel, for the cross. God, that you've given us because of your son a life of joy, yes, suffering, but also joy. 
God, I ask that uh, you open the hearts of the people that hear your word and that know you, God, to seek you, to desire to seek you, to desire to know you more, God, to choose to not be offended and to choose forgiveness. God, I ask that you melt them. You pull them off that little cycle, God, of self-doubt and anxiety and unforgiveness and bitterness as they've harbored things, God, and just allow them to give those offenses to you, to lay them down, to walk in the freedom of life with you. God, I thank you for the work that you're doing in the families and the lives of the people that listen to this, for the hearts you're changing. God, we thank you for your son and how good you are. In Jesus' name, amen. You move as the Lord leads you. We'd love to pray with you. I would rather have Jesus in silver or gold. I would rather be his than have riches and toll. I would rather have Jesus than houses or lamps. I would rather be led by his nail pierced hands than to be. Good day in the house of the Lord, amen. Let me, let me tell you guys about what happened to me this morning. So I have this really great story that I, that I was telling the first service. I'll tell you now. So in the 90s, there was this rock band called Godsmack. It's a great name, Godsmack. And the media asked them, you know, how did you get this name? And then the, the, the lead singer said, well, I was making fun of this guy who had a cold sore on his face. And then the next week I got a cold sore on my face. And then my band laughed at me and said, ha, 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 God smacked you. And so that's how they came. So I was telling that story to the first service. And while I'm telling this story, follow me in the dark, I apologize. But I hear this going on. 
I thought someone was coming to get me. And it was a two-year-old. And I lost the whole congregation because a cute two-year-old ran up on stage. I was so mad. <laughs> so mad. <laughs> Have you, are you guys enjoying this humility service? Let me tell you what it's doing in my life. It is so freeing. I thought, you know, we're going to talk about humility. You know, we're going to... Uh, be talking about putting ourselves down, making ourselves low, and you know, it was gonna be depressing and all of this stuff. It is such a freeing thing. I have so much more joy in my life than I did before. So much more joy. Uh, one of the things that we've been focusing on as a staff for a while now is thinking the best of people. Thinking the best of when someone says something, just to be able to go, they didn't mean that. <laughs> The way I took it, they didn't mean that. There's something else going on. And how freeing and how, how much joy we can get from being humble, from having, for having humility in our lives. And so this has just been an incredible series. I hope you guys are, are enjoying it and getting things out of this. Um, and you're able to apply it into your life because it will change you. It will change the people around you if you just give it a chance. So I hope you guys are doing that. I have one announcement for you guys before you go. This is the second Wednesday of the month. So there are second Wednesday, second Sunday of the month, which means, which means I have so much humility in my life that that's not going to, I'm not going to take offense of you guys laughing at me all the time. <laughs> But we have Starting Point, uh, today's Starting Point. So if you're new to the church, you've never been to Starting Point, have questions about the church, we'd love this opportunity to get to know you. Uh, starting Point's gonna be for like the first 15 minutes after the service in room 204 over this way. We'd love to have you guys, if you have kids, uh, childcare knows about Starting Point and they're here to watch your kids for that extra time. So no real excuses unless you, you're afraid of me and don't be, uh, but would love to be able to meet you. Love to be able to have some conversations with you. Let me say a prayer for our service and a prayer for our week as we're gonna go out into this world and live on mission for God. Father God, Lord, um, just thank you and praise you today for all that you've done, God. I ask you to be with our, with our church as we go out this week, God. Lord, uh, shine your face upon them, God. Give them strength, give them protection as we are out. Um, living our life on mission for you, God. Help us to interact with the people that you're putting in front of us, God, and help us shine your glory upon everybody that sees us this week, God. Lord, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.